reading from Leviticus 11. I think it's around page 112 of the Church Bible. Every creature that moves along the ground is to be regarded as unclean. It is not to be eaten. You are not to eat any creature that moves along the ground, whether it moves on its belly, or walks on all fours, or on many feet. It is unclean. Do not defile yourselves by any of these creatures. Do not make yourselves unclean by means of them, or be made unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord, who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God, and therefore be holy, because I am holy. These are the regulations concerning animals, birds, every living thing that moves about in the water, and every creature that moves along the ground. You must distinguish between the unclean and the clean, between living creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, A woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days, just as she is unclean during a monthly period. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Then the woman must wait 33 days to be purified from a bleeding. She must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. If she gives birth to a daughter, for two weeks the woman will be unclean as during, the, during her period. Then she must wait 66 days to be purified from a bleeding. When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. You shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she'll be ceremonially clean from a flow of blood. These are the regulations for the woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. Thanks, Philip, and good afternoon. Just going to check this is recording. Last week, we managed to pack away the iPad with it still recording. <laughs> so it was still recording until it went out of battery. So we had something like 26 hours of black screen that I had to edit out. But it looks like we're okay. Um, uh, one writer I was reading this week said that um, Leviticus reads like a guidebook to a foreign land. And the sections that deal with questions about purity introduce us to the strangest area within its boundaries. It's a very poetic way of saying the section we've got before us is pretty weird and pretty difficult. Um, for five chapters, from chapter 11 through to chapter 15, we get detailed instructions about what foods may or may not be eaten. What to do when a woman gives birth what to do about infectious skin diseases, or when your house has mildew. And finally, what to do when men and women experience various discharges from their body. So over the years, many people have said that these might possibly be the least attractive bits of the, of, uh, the, the whole Bible, seen as meaningless or repulsive even. And um, at our staff meeting earlier this week, um, Sam said to me with a big smile on his face, you're welcome. Um, well, I want to put um, up on the screen, this is a quote from um, Rachel Jones. She's written um, this book, A Brief Theology of Periods. Um, let me read out her quote. She's, this is a quote from, uh, she's got a chapter in the book on Leviticus 15 itself. Uh, have, a, have a listen to what she says. What's your initial internal reaction to reading that? 
confused, outraged, ashamed. Here's mine. Really, God, unclean for one week in four or possibly more for something that is entirely natural and healthy. Why? What's your problem with periods? Do you just hate women? So where do I go from there? How do I navigate the tension between my instinctive reaction on the one hand and on the other, my belief that God is good and the Bible is his word and that he loves me as his daughter? What's a woman to do with a passage like Leviticus 15? It's a great question, isn't it? How do I, how do we, how, how do you navigate that tension between our initial instinctive reaction? And on the one hand, and our, and our trust in God's goodness and in the goodness of his word on the other. It's a, it's a really important question for us to, to wrestle with. Here's some, some possible options. Number one, just we, we could just ignore it. It's all a bit weird. So why don't we just not read it, not worry about it? Option number one. N number two. We can just shrug our shoulders and reassure ourselves that they don't apply to me anymore. It's, it's okay. And number three, could resign ourselves to, to put up with it. We don't like it, but it's God's word, so we just have to lump it. There's three possible reactions when it comes to passages like this that are just hard. Well, I want to suggest there is a fourth option. And we've, we've read these verses now, so we can't ignore them. And whilst it's true up to a point that these laws don't apply to us today as they once did for Israel, as we see in, in, uh, in Mark 7, uh, Jesus declares all foods clean now for us, and, and in Acts 10 as well. But nevertheless, these laws do still reveal to us something of God's character, something of his priorities, what's what's important to him and we cannot say well that was what god was like in the old testament i'm glad he's not like that now because our god doesn't change he's the same yesterday today and forever and at grace church we we hold that that all of god's word is true and it is good and it is something that we can not just trust in but but delight in sometimes we have to work hard to get to that point sometimes it takes a lot of time and prayer but if we humble ourselves and ask god he listens to that prayer he he answers he helps us to find the goodness and grace uh, his goodness and grace in, in his word. So that's what I want us to do right now, just to ask him to show us his goodness as we look at this obscure bit of the Bible. Let's, let's pray and ask for his help. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who has revealed himself to us. We thank you that you're a God who speaks. We thank you for your word. We pray you would humble us, we pray you would show us your goodness, show us your grace, show us the Lord Jesus. Please, Lord, by your spirit, help us to see him. We need your help. Amen. 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 Well, as we start off, we need to do some work to understand what's going on in those words, clean and unclean. What, what do they really mean? What's, what's really going on? And actually, there's two main uh, common misconceptions that we can have when it with this whole idea of being clean and, and unclean the first misconception is that we can think it's, it's all to do with hygiene the second one is that we can think unclean equals sin or well, sometimes a, a direct result of willful sin that we commit is is that we are unclean about that other times we are unclean as a result of just living in a broken and cursed world following the fall in, in Genesis 3. So things like skin disease, 
things like periods, as we read in, in chapter 15 here, they would fall into that, that category, not morally sinful, but just the result of living in a broken and cursed world. It's more helpful to think of in, uh, clean and unclean, to, to think in terms of three states. So up on the screen, here's a diagram to help us get this in our heads. There's, there's three states in, in view as, as we look at the Old Testament, as we look at the book of Leviticus in particular. Um, holy, common or clean, and, and unclean. As we've seen in Leviticus, God is holy, set apart, perfect, pure. The opposite of holy is not unclean, as, as we might think. The opposite of holy is, is common, ordinary, clean. Things that are common, things that are ordinary, can be made unclean. Things that are unclean can be made clean again via sacrifices. And things that are clean can also be sanctified to be made holy. As we saw last week with, with the priests, they were sanctified um, to, to be made holy, to be made set apart, to fulfill the role that the Lord had called them to do. Um, so it's helpful to have those sort of states, those categories in our heads as we go through these chapters. But why is this issue of uncleanness an issue in the first place. Well, in Exodus 33, verse 3, we get a glimpse into the problem that Leviticus is, is um, designed to fix. In Exodus 33, verse 3, the Lord says this, go up into the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. God is holy. He is set apart. He is pure. He is perfect. And it's not like he's just sort of 27% holy, as if there's a kind of pie chart of the attributes of God that, you know, 27% holy, 34% love, 15% justice. He is infinite. His holiness is infinite. His, his love is infinite. His justice is infinite infinite it's not like god is just a better version of us he's utterly different to us he is set apart he is holy sam talks uh, uh, earlier on in our studies in leviticus about how the bible sometimes talks of holiness in terms of light and darkness and you just can't have light and darkness together at the same time and it's like that with 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 our holy god and with sin and uncleanness. So do you see this issue for God, this problem that God has? How can he, a holy God, dwell with sinful, unclean people and not destroy them because of their sin, because of their uncleanness? Or as Leviticus 15, 31 puts it, you must keep the Israelites separate from the things that make them unclean so they will not die in their uncleanness for defiling my dwelling place, which is among them. So the sacrificial system, the purity regulations in these chapters provide the way for his people to have their sins forgiven and, and be made clean. But what's so vital for us to grasp is that God, in, in setting out these rules and these regulations and these complex systems, God's not wanting to make life unnecessarily hard for us, just for the sake of it, just for kicks. Rather, because he wants to be in relationship with us, because he wants to dwell with us, this is what he does in order to make that possible, to make that a reality. And it's, it's that love that motivates him setting out these regulations and this sacrificial system. And when we, when we see it like that, when we see the extraordinary lengths that he goes to in order to make it possible for his people to dwell with him, it shows us a precious 
picture of his goodness and his grace and his heart. He longs to be in relationship with us. Well, this afternoon, we're going to do a whistle-stop tour, summarising what's said in these chapters, and then think, what, what does that mean for us today? How does this lead us to the Lord Jesus? That's where we'll, we'll end up. So chapter 11. Clean and unclean food and animals. Well, the first 23 verses of this chapter deal with um, the animals which may or may not be eaten as food. The animals which, if we eat, will either make us uh, unclean or, or not. And then from verses 24 to 25, uh, it moves on to uncleanness caused by contact with certain animals. And actually, it's pretty tricky to know what the rationale is behind the various categories and decisions. And if you look into it, there's actually a, a whole bunch of speculation that goes up pages and books and debates as to why this and not this and what's this and oh, I've got a theory about that. And what, what, what actually tends to happen is that we miss the wood for the trees. We don't really get to the point of, of what's going on here when we get caught up in all of that kind of speculation and stuff. Because as you go through chapter 11, the passages don't explicitly state why or, or why not. Some animals are clean and others not. But what we do see is three primary classifications in, in, in that chapter, land, water, and air. And within those classifications, the, the forms of movement that uh, uh, in, in those classifications, land, water, and air. And as we kind of think about those classifications, there's strong echoes taking us back to creation, to the book of Genesis. And it seems as you go through chapter 11, the preference is for, for what is seen as normal in those categories. Anything that's sort of blurring the boundaries between land, water, air, and movement and, and those sorts of things, anything that's sort of blurring those kind of boundaries is not for eating because that's going to make you unclean. But again, the passage doesn't spell out exactly the precise reasoning behind one and not the others, that kind of thing. Instead, have a look at verses 44 onwards. So at the end of this chapter on, on clean and unclean food, the Lord says this, I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore be holy because I am holy. These are the regulations concerning animals, birds, and every living thing that moves about in the water and every creature that moves along the ground. You must distinguish between the clean and the unclean, between living creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. So these distinct food laws were to, to symbolize their distinctiveness as, as the people of God. Every mealtime, their choice of food would remind them that they'd been chosen, that they'd been redeemed out of slavery, out of Egypt by the Lord and called to be his people, set apart, distinct from, from the rest of the world. And so their distinct set apart diet symbolizes that, reflects it, shows it to them uh, uh, every time they eat. Now in, uh, in Mark chapter seven, Jesus shows how actually these food laws don't, don't apply in, in the same way. In, uh, in chapter seven, Jesus says, uh, says this, nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather is what comes out of a person that defiles them. What Jesus says to those people there is, uh, it's not what comes into your stomach that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your heart that makes you unclean. Um, takes this to a whole nother level. And as Mark indicates in chapter seven, by saying this, Jesus declares all food 
clean. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter has this amazing vision where uh, uh, he's told to take and eat of all the things that growing up he was told he should avoid and get away from that he's now told it's, it's good, go for it, fill your boots, eat it, uh, go for it, because the gospel is now for everyone. It's not about just the, the, the Jews, uh, the non-Jews too, the Gentiles. So the distinctive food laws are no longer needed to, to show those, that kind of separation between Israel and, and the rest of the world. We don't have time to go into that in too much more detail, maybe in home groups later, you can um, look into that a bit more. Uh, we're, we need to move on to chapter 12. Chapter 12, uncleanness due to childbirth. So if chapter 11, and the uncleanness there is, is caused by external factors, by what you eat or by what you come into contact with. Chapter 12 onwards, and especially chapter 15, it's about uncleanness that's caused by natural functions of the human body. And then and this again is where it's important to stress that uncleanness doesn't always imply moral sinfulness. We can't make that automatic connection. Every sin makes us unclean, as Leviticus tells us, as the rest of the Old Testament does. But there's nothing morally sinful about periods or about childbirth. In the, at the start of Genesis, what's God's command to Adam and Eve? To, to fill the earth and subdue it, to have babies. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a natural thing. It's something to be delighted in and enjoyed. And the Bible um, commands us to, to, to do that. And we've made connections already with creation and Genesis. What happens next in the creation story? The fall. Adam and Eve's rebellion against God. Sin coming into the world as a result. And, and death. And the curse. The curses. Creation itself. Humanity. Broken. Marred. And as we know, childbirth comes under the curse and is marred and is difficult and, and painful as a result. And it's ritually unclean, not because it's sinful or because of specific moral failure, but because it's become tainted, because it's part of the broken world that we, that we live in. Chapter 13 and 14 moves on to uncleanness due to infections. Now, I've had a number of conversations with people over the last few weeks about how they really don't envy the amount of work the priests had to do. These guys had to be expert butchers with all the animal sacrifices that they've got going on. Not only that, they've got to be public health inspectors as well as you read these chapters. Diagnosing skin diseases, infections in fabrics and houses too. The priests were expected to correctly identify how serious skin disease and infections are and prescribe what needs to be done. Is it something that's chronic? Is it skin deep? Are there weird discolored hairs? I mean, as you read through, you can, you can kind of see that. This is what the, the priests are having to, to look into. Even with the homes as well, mildew, how big a thing is this? We're going to Treat it, come back a week's time, see if it's still there, or do we have to demolish the whole house? It's the priests that are making these kind of inspections and decisions. But what's striking as you, as you read through those chapters is that the, the cleansing rituals for people and for homes are lengthy, they're significant, and they're public. So just think about that. that for a moment, but they're lengthy, significant, and public, which would have provided some assurances for those suffering. But now they've gone through these lengthy, significant public rituals. Now all will be well. It's done. They're, they're now clean again. 
But because they're public, it would demonstrate to everyone else around that they are clean again. They can reintegrate into society and, and they can rejoin the community and, and they can rejoin worship again. So that's chapters 13 and 14, uncleanness due to infections. Finally, chapter 15, uncleanness due to bodily discharges. You get the regulations for male and female discharges. And uh, throughout history, these, these verses have been wrongly used to oppress women. And uh, they've also been wrongly regarded as oppressing women at the same time, if you get what I mean. But just from the, the way that this chapter is set out, we notice there is there's equal time and space given to, to men and women. So as you kind of trace through the, the structure of it, it begins with chronic male discharges, then moves on to short-term male discharges, then short-term female discharges, and, and then chronic female discharges. And in terms of what's required to, to make clean, there's not the same level of sacrifices and, uh, and that kind of thing that, that's needed as there are for, for other bits, just washing and time. And so again, as with chapter 12, what's in view here is not sinful moral failure, but the natural consequences of being part of a fallen and broken world. Now, there's much more that could be said here. And um, Rachel's book is, is really helpful, really clear. I highly recommend that to you if you want to get into that a bit more. But what are we to make of all of this? But there's two things that really strike you as you look at the kind of sweep of these chapters. The first is this. Holiness is woven into every aspect of life. Holiness is woven into every aspect of life. And perhaps we tend to think of, of holiness as some kind of abstract, ethereal concept but, but as you go through these chapters, it has to do with the nitty gritty realities of, of every aspect of life. Holiness is woven into every aspect. It's tangible, physical reminders every mealtime. And in all aspects of life, that, that they were God's people, redeemed by him, called to be separate, called to be holy. And before we kind of get on to Looking at Jesus, it's good for us to ask, how does this challenge us today? To ask ourselves, is holiness woven into every aspect of, of our lives? How distinctive are, are we, am I, are, are you? At school, after an exam has just happened, how distinctive? are we at work with our neighbors with, with our family is holiness woven into every aspect of our lives or or just the box it up to what we do on a sunday when, when we're here together let me ask what would what would your children say are your priorities as they look at how you spend your time, your money, and what you do as a family together, the decisions that you make, what, what would they say are the driving realities, the things that are, uh, are, are your priorities? It's challenging, isn't it? Well, I wonder how could meal times be a space and a time where you can remind yourself that you've been redeemed by God and called to be distinct? What, what could you do this week? So that's the first, the first thing that these chapters sh show us that, that jumps out. Holiness is woven into every aspect of life. But secondly, they show us that, that we need a cure. We need a cure. 
as you read through these chapters, all these regulations can do is just tell us what needs to be done for someone to be able to re-enter community and come back to worship again until they are made unclean again and the cycle repeats itself and so on and so on and so on. In chapter 15, it's, it's particularly stark. The regulations are powerless to fix someone who's suffering from, from chronic bleeding. There's, there's nothing to be done. There, there's no cure. And for the person suffering in that way, this is a policy of, of despair for them. And I want us to, to uh, turn over to uh, Mark chapter 5. For a few moments here, Mark chapter 5, verses 25 to 34. It's up on the screen as well, but um, do open it up if, if that's helpful. This is part of an extraordinary day in Jesus' life and ministry. It's well worth reading the whole of this chapter, see what goes on. It's uh, one of my favorite bits of the whole Bible. Um, then Mark says this, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciple answered, and yet you can ask who touched me. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. It's pretty striking, isn't it? When have, having read what we've just read in Leviticus, for this woman, she was unclean because of that chronic bleeding, persistent bleeding. She would have been not permitted to, to worship in the temple because of that. She would have been not permitted to embrace anybody even. She'd have been an outcast lest anyone be made unclean by coming into contact with her. And this was the story for 12 years for this, for this woman. Maybe she would have articulated the same question as, as Rachel Jones that we read earlier. How does Jesus respond to this woman? It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Of his compassion, his, his tenderness, his gentleness with this woman. He calls her daughter. Actually, this is the only time in all the gospels that Jesus calls anybody daughter. And it's this woman who for 12 years have been suffering as much as she had. What does Jesus do? He stops the bleeding immediately. He, he cleanses her. He heals her. He makes her whole. And he restores her publicly in front of everybody it's not just some sort of mumbo jumbo magic trick that she touched his cloak and her faith in in him and and him just healing her that's what was going on and do you notice how he upholds the law and the regulations and makes them obsolete at the same time in this phrase he doesn't sort of dumb down the requirements of holiness or lower the barrier or, or that kind of thing. He fulfills them. He brings the cure that the regulations couldn't deliver. He did what the law was powerless to do. He makes clean. He makes whole. He takes away shame. He forgives. That's what he does. That's, that's who he is. This is our God. 
And how does he do that? How is he able to do that? Because he was made impure. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. So God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He's able to, to cleanse, heal, make whole, forgive because he was made impure. He was made sin so that he might, by his perfect once and for all sacrifice, deal with our sin, deal with our uncleanness and make it possible for us to, to be in relationship with him. Well, let's, um, let's finish up there. Let me pray. <coughs> Some words from Revelation 21. This is where, this is where history is headed. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a, long, a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that that's where history is heading. We thank you for this hope that is certain and sure. This is, this is what's in store for us who are trusting in Jesus. Thank you for the glimpses we've had this afternoon of, of your goodness and your grace. Thank you for showing us the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his kindness, his compassion. Thank you that he was willing to be made sin for us so that we could be made righteous. Thank you that he chose the cross so we could go free, so we could be forgiven and cleansed. Thank you for that amazing good news. Help us, Lord, to, to respond as we ought to that amazing good news to that offer of full and free forgiveness of cleansing from sin and of eternal hope help us lord to to not turn away from that but to grasp it with both hands and help us lord to live lives in response to all that you've done with holiness shaping all that we're about May we be distinct. May we live lives that, that others around see and ask us for the reason, the hope that we have, that we may tell them about the Lord Jesus, tell them about the gospel. Please, Lord, how we need your help. In Jesus' name and for his glory we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.